Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual talk. Um, as I've mentioned already, but because it's now being recorded, I will say that you are joined by myself, Gauthar Hashmi, um, the head imam of Shah Jahan Mosque, Hafiz Hashmi, and Habib, uh, who is Muhammad Habib, who is the mosque manager. So I'm now going to take over again. Sorry, um, a slideshow presentation. Actually, I'll um, Oh, yeah, and if I could also request everyone to mute themselves so that we don't have any uh, disruptions while we go through the next part of the slideshow. So I'm gonna share my screen with you or attempt to share my screen with you. Hopefully you can see this. Um, uh, in that time, I am going to have Habib. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, happy International Women's Day. I uh, hope you're all staying safe. Uh, and you all look like you're nice, warm inside, um, cozy in your living rooms. Um, so I will talk a little bit about the history of the mosque. Um, I'm sure some of you are aware, some of you uh, do look quite familiar. Um, so I'll try not, try not to be boring and as informative as possible. Um, so the Shah Jahan Mosque is the first purpose-built mosque uh, in Northwestern Europe. Um, there were earlier mosques uh, in the UK, in Liverpool. Uh, however, that was just a house that was used for prayers. Um, so the Shah Jahan Mosque is the first purpose-built mosque and it was built in the year 1889. Um, the gentleman who built the mosque, his name was Professor Gottlieb Leitner. And he was born in Budapest in 1841, okay, and his family were, were Jewish. Um, at the age of eight, his father sadly passed away, and his mother remarried a Catholic Christian from Turkey, so they migrated to Turkey. Um, by the age of 14, he could speak eight languages fluently. Um, one of those was Arabic. Um, and a few other languages which aren't very easy to learn. Um, at the age of 18, he actually came to the UK and he studied in King's University. He studied linguistics um, and then he moved to India uh, where he spent most of his life. At 16, he actually was a translator for the British during the Crimean War. So he did that for a few years um, and then spent a few years at King's University. Then he moved to India where he was the head of the Punjab University, which was one of the largest educational institutes uh, in India. So he spent 21 years of his life uh, in India. Uh, he then kind of had a vision to set up a, an institute of learning uh, in Europe. Um, so what actually attracted him to Woking is, next to where the mosque actually sits, uh, where there's currently the Lion Retail Park, there was a large building there called the Royal Dramatic College. Uh, and in 1884, this was up for sale. So he purchased this building uh, along with eight acres of land around it. And the land cost 200 pounds, you know, in those days. So the first thing that brought him to Woking was the Royal Dramatic College. The second thing was the cost of the land. And also the plot was right near the railway line. So he felt it was in a prime location um, for people as they went by on their travels, uh, Woking being a commuter town, uh, a great way to sort of market um, the actual uh, complex itself as people would get to see it on their, on their travels. Um, so the reason why he built the mosque is the Royal Dramatic College turned into the Oriental Institute of Learning. So the mosque was built as a place of worship for students that were coming primarily from India to study at the Oriental College. Uh, the mosque actually sits on Oriental Road uh, and this road used to be called Maybury Heath Lane and it was renamed Oriental Road after the Oriental College. Um, so he then uh, had very strong links in India. Uh, the man who actually designed the mosque uh, was, a, was a Christian architect from Guildford called William Isaac Chambers. Uh, and he has designed a few houses in the Guildford area, which I believe are listed. So he's the man who designed the mosque and he had never designed a mosque before. So he needed to take some sort of inspiration. So the mosque is really based on Mughal Indian style uh, architecture. However, he also took inspiration from Turkish and Egyptian mosques. Um, so then when it came to actual funding of the building, 
um, he had exercised all of his funds. So he approached the Begum of Bhopal, uh, Begum Shah Jahan, who the mosque is named after. Uh, and she obviously was a female and she contributed 5,000 uh, pounds for the actual building of the mosque. Uh, and she was a Muslim by faith. Um, so obviously she was the main donor of, uh, of the mosque. So without her, the mosque wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have been financially uh, affordable. Um, so the mosque was completed in 1889. Um, the remarkable thing about the history is you see people from three different faiths all coming together. Uh, Professor Leitner actually converted to Christianity, as far as we know, uh, but he was born into, in a Jewish family. So you, 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 know, you see people of the Jewish background, uh, the architect being a Christian and the princess being a Muslim, uh, all sort of working together. Uh, which I think sends out a really strong message of, of uh, coercion and peace and unity, which is what all, all faiths teach. Um, so once the mosque was established, Professor Leitner's actual vision was to build a temple and a synagogue and a church on the actual complex, on the actual site. However, he only got as far as the mosque and 10 years after its establishment, he passed away in 1899. Um, now across the road, uh, there's a church. Uh, and I believe that the land where the church is built once upon a time belonged to the mosque. And it was kind of given uh, kind of at a mate's rates, you know, to kind of fulfill some of that vision that he had. Uh, so I believe the church was built, I think in the 1920s. Uh, I may be wrong, but, you know, slightly after the mosque. Uh, so once Professor Leitner died, the mosque fell into disrepute. There was no Muslims actually living in Woking uh, and the Oriental College uh, that became Lion Works, James Walker. Uh, if any of you are from the Woking area, it was one of the main sort of factories at the time, employers at the time. Um, so for 12 years, the mosque is abandoned. Then there's a barrister from India called Waja Kamaluddin. And he actually partnered up with uh, somebody called Lord Headley. Uh, who was somebody who was quite high up in, in Parliament, and he had become Muslim uh, along with his wife, Lady Jane. So they both basically um, rescued the mosque from potentially being knocked down. So there was court cases and, and things going on. Um, so in the sort of Victorian period, you had uh, a big increase in people accepting Islam. Uh, a lot of them were women. Uh, and all of the early imams of the mosque, they were all white British men that had uh, entered the faith. So you may hear the term, you know, converted uh, to the faith. Um, in the 1950s, uh, there was around 1000 Muslims in Britain uh, and a large portion of them were people that had entered the faith. Uh, I mean, moving on now in 2021, there's 10,000 Muslims just in, in Woking. Um, so it kind of shows how Islam has sort of uh, increased uh, within the population. Um, I mean, the migrants who came over in the 60s, uh, like my father, and the first generation of migrants who came to work, uh, a lot of them were allowed in purely because of the contribution of the Indian Muslim soldiers in World War I and World War II. Um, so there was, I believe, three and a half million um, soldiers that fought across both wars that were Indian Muslims. And I also believe that the largest reserve army uh, for Great Britain were Indian you know, Muslims and the most amount of Victorian crosses uh, were uh, Indian Muslims obtained these. Um, so it was a, a very significant uh, contribution. Uh, we also have something called the Peace Garden, which is in the Horsel Common, which was a cemetery for these soldiers. Uh, and currently it's, uh, it's been renovated and it's a peace garden. So this is one of the other famous uh, historical attractions in Woking uh, alongside um, Brookwood Cemetery as well, which is the largest cemetery in Europe and was the largest in the world, I believe in 1854 or 52 when it actually came about. So there's a very large Muslim section there. Uh, and a lot of the prominent Muslim men, men and women that were involved in the mosque uh, are all laid to rest uh, on those grounds. Um, so that's kind of a kind of a brief uh, introduction into the history of the building. Uh, and Professor Leitner is also buried uh, in Brookwood Cemetery on the consecrated side. 
uh, of Brookwood Cemetery. So he's also laid to rest there. Uh, and he was a great academic. Uh, you know, he could speak 50 languages fluently. Uh, he'd authored many books. Uh, and in India, he set up many, many institutions of learning. So he was a, a huge academic. Uh, and the mosque is, you know, a, a piece of history which is here due to his sort of vision, his, his struggles. Uh, as you can imagine in those times, um, the mosque was a very alien-like building uh, and these things were quite difficult uh, when something new comes about for people to kind of accept. So they faced a lot of challenges, um, which they managed to overcome. Um, and yeah, the mosque is definitely a place which uh, once things get back to normal, hopefully soon that you know you guys are all welcome to come and actually see the building i don't think the photos and the videos uh, do it justice but you really have to see it to appreciate it it's quite small uh, a lot of people you know expect it to be you know very big um but we do have prayer halls which accommodate up to uh, 2000 worshippers in a non covid situation so our fridays which is the equivalent of uh, sunday at a church uh, or saturday at a synagogue are, you know uh, do get quite busy. Um, so with the current pandemic, obviously we're restricted. So we've lost about, you know, 70% capacity with social distancing, but, you know, we're just trying to work around um, and try to make uh, what we can of a quite a bad situation. Um, so that's, uh, that's a brief sort of introduction uh, into the history, just to give you guys a bit of insight into the actual building and the story behind it. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Habib. That was really insightful. Um, Habib's uh, become an expert on doing these kind of things now. Um, don't worry, you'll have plenty of time for questions later. So we're going to move on now to a virtual tour. Um, let's hope the technology works. We're nearly there, though. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. Hope you're all safe and well during the COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome to the Shah Jahan Mosque in Woking, which is the first purpose-built mosque in Great Britain, built in 1889 by the Jewish linguist Gottlieb Leitner, designed by the local Christian architect William Chambers, and paid for by the Begum of Bhopal Shah Jahan. As you can see, it's a very beautiful building. You can see the dome, the crescent moon at the top, and the minarets. Let's go and take a look inside. Before we enter inside the mosque, we'll be taking our shoes off, as it's a place of respect, and also a place that we like to keep clean. As you can see, uh, Panther, the mosque cat, is uh, accompanying me as usual. So I'll take my shoes off, and then we'll head inside the old historical building. So now we've entered the beautiful uh, building. Uh, it's quite a small building, and the outside of this looks slightly bigger. And as you can see, the beautiful prayer mats on the floor here. We can accommodate around about 60 worshippers. However, we have prayer halls that we'll be going to uh, a little bit later on, where we do conduct our daily prayers and our Friday sessions. As you can see above, in the four corners, you can see the honeycombs, where we have the 99 different attributes of Allah, God. Uh, examples of those are the most merciful, the most kind, the most generous, the most forgiving. You can see the really beautiful uh, architecture uh, and the bright colours that we have, uh, and it's amazing. We also have a beautiful chandelier um, which hangs and really lights up the mosque and brings out all the colours. Uh, this area here, the niche in the wall, is called the mihrab. This is where the imam would stand and lead the prayer, and this faces towards uh, the Kaaba, the black cube, which is in Mecca. You can also see the clocks, there's quite a lot of clocks in here, and these clocks show us the five daily prayers. Uh, and the sixth clock is for our Friday session, which is the equivalent of having uh, a Sunday uh, service in church or uh, a, a sermon on Saturday uh, if you're Jewish. So this is the uh, clocks. Here we have the Quran, which is the holy book uh, for Muslims. Um, these are usually kept uh, in a cupboard or somewhere high. Uh, and I'll just open one of the Qurans up so you can see the, the beautiful Arabic um, script here. And as you can see, I'm opening the Quran from the right to the left. Um, we also have prayer beads. Um, so people would come and use the prayer beads and pray, very similar to a rosary. Um, so we also have uh, these here. This small pulpit here is called the mimba. 
and usually this is where the Imam would give the Friday sermon. This one is more sort of symbolic as our Friday services are given in a big member, which is in the prayer halls, which is where we'll be going to now. So behind me are the prayer halls. Uh, these actually used to be old warehouse buildings that were converted to prayer halls in the 90s. They can't accommodate up to 2,000 worshippers in a normal situation. Due to the current climate of COVID, we have around about 350 worshippers uh, across all three prayer halls. Uh, so we'll head inside and have a look. This is our shoe rack area. So again, I'll take my shoes off once again uh, before we enter inside the... We are inside the men's prayer hall now. As you can see, it's a very vibrant space. The carpets are very, very comfortable and we can normally get around about 800 worshippers in here. Um, as you can see, we also have the, the clocks, which are the prayer times. Time is something of the essence, and it's very much emphasised within Islam. Uh, again, we have the special prayer mat at the front for the Imam, where you stand and lead the prayer. Uh, and this is the mimbar, the pulpit, where the Friday sermon is given from. Uh, and as you can see, you can see all the, the different prayers uh, and verses from the Quran. Due to the current climate with COVID-19, we obviously have strict measures within the mosque to ensure the safety of our worshippers and the wider community. So we have one-way entry and exit systems. We also have social distancing within the prayer halls. So as you can see, everybody knows where they need to come and be, so they're praying safely and socially distanced, as well as having multiple signage around the halls and having um, multiple areas where people can sanitize their hands, uh, and also you know, advising people to avoid shaking hands and congregating after prayer especially. Now we have uh, Sayyid Imam Hashmi here, who's the head Imam of the Shah Jahan Mosque and has been head Imam for over 10 years now. He would now recite some verses from the Holy Quran which are recited in our regular five daily prayers. Hello everyone and welcome in a, a virtual visit. Thank you for watching us and thank you for being with us. I am going to decide what we recite in our prayers. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين نعمت عليهم غير المردوب عليهم على الضالين آمين الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد So we're in the ladies hall now, as you can see it's a different colour carpet here uh, but again it's uh, very beautiful and you can see all of the social distancing measures in place. Some of the activities that take part uh, take place in the mosque other than the, the ritual prayers, we also conduct marriages, funerals, we also have uh, a part-time education system here for children, we have over 250 children that come here uh, in the evenings, a bit like a Sunday school uh, in church. We also have various sports activities uh, like wrestling, archery, uh, the Imams also quite heavily involved in cricket, football, badminton and other sports in the local area. We also do a lot of community community engagement and also a lot of interfaith and intrafaith work as well. Um, so the mosque is a very busy place, a very active place. And we, we also have sports activities uh, for women as well, as well as uh, adult education um, for women, which the Imam's wife is also involved in. Uh, we also have a lot of interfaith, intrafaith, uh, and the mosque is really uh, keen on sort of engaging uh, people from different religions and, and building a sort of understanding and building stronger relationships within, within communities. We also recently did a, a food bank during the, the lockdown period where we helped over 1,500 people with meals, vulnerable families uh, in the local community. So the mosque really works closely with local authorities as well as people from the local community to really build strong relationships and promote the, the true message of Islam, which is peace, harmony uh, and brotherhood. So the building behind me is the Sir Salah Jung building. This is a grade two listed building and the Shah Jahan Mosque itself is the only grade one listed mosque in Great Britain. This building used to be a museum, a publishing house and a library and also residence for the Imam. Currently we have a library, a meeting room space and also residence for the Imam. So we'll head on inside and have a quick look. So here we have the library. Uh, as you can see we have a lot of old uh, Arabic texts here, um, different, uh, different hadiths, different Qurans, different books uh, and the strong emphasis on reading and learning. We also have old, old Bibles here, old Torahs and old uh, Christian dictionaries here. Um, and as you know, within Islam, we have the four holy books. So um, the library is a very important place, a place of learning, a place of education, and it is regularly used 
um, by people. Um, so thank you very much for, for watching uh, and hopefully you've enjoyed the, the short virtual tour of the Shah Jahan Mosque. Thank you. So that was um, quite a quick whistle tour of uh, the mosque, but I'm, I'm sure you've been um, overloaded with information there. <laughs> Lots uh, of things to take in. And the eagle eyed amongst you will have noticed that we are actually sat in the library right now that was shown in the video. Um, so let's move on. What is the link between International Women's Day and Shah Jahan Mosque? I think most of you will have figured that out now as well. Um, if you didn't already know, the mosque is named after a woman. And that woman is the Sultan, or was the Sultan of Popal, Shah Jahan Begum. And um, as Habib mentioned earlier, she made a, what was then a substantial financial contribution. I mean, £5,000 nowadays doesn't really get you very far, uh, but it was um, enough for, at that time to um, build the mosque. So this is a picture of Shah Jahan Begum. Um, just that over so I can see properly. Um, and she ruled over two different periods. And the first time uh, she was only six years old. So her mother had to step in for her. And then later on, the second peri period um, was between 1868 and 1901. And she was actually uh, one of four successive women rulers or Begums of Bhopal between 1819 and 1926. Now, I didn't know that before looking into this and doing a bit of research, which I think is amazing. There's actually a lot of history uh, uh, you know, behind uh, Islam that we don't still know about and the great um, achievements and contribution of uh, Muslim women. Uh, so I think there's a huge gap uh, for historians to look into. So let's move on and look uh, into a little bit of the contributions of Shah Jahan Begum. She improved the tax revenue system and increased state intake. She raised the salaries of her soldiers. She modernized the military's army. She built a dam and artificial lake. And these are just a few of her things, by the way. I couldn't give it justice within the short amount of time that we have to go through. And she improved the efficiency of the police force and undertook the first census after the state suffered two plagues. That's a huge amount of work already. Um, she has been, oh, this is coming my way again. That. She has been credited with the authorship of several books in Urdu. Um, some of them include an autobiography. Um, she's written about um, some of the major events that took place between the first and seventh year of her regime, uh, which looked at the social and political conditions of Popal at that time. And she also, quite interestingly, she wrote a book on Purda, which is hijab. Uh, in uh, the customs of hijab in Europe, Asia, and Egypt in 1918, which I thought I, I'm going to look into that a bit more. I don't know the details about that. And she was instrumental in initiating the construction of one, one of the largest mosques in India, the Taj al Masajid at Bhopal. And you can see, uh, no, that's not the picture of that. That's the Taj Mahal. And so, yeah, she built the Taj Mahal Palace at Bhopal. This is not the Taj Mahal in famously known in India. This is a different one and it's in Bhopal and you can see the picture there in the top right corner. She also contributed generously towards the founding of the Mohammedan Anglo Oriental College at Aligarh, which developed into the Aligarh Muslim University and you can see a picture of the entrance there at the bottom. And she also subsidized the cost of a railway to be constructed between Hoshangabad and Bhopal. You can see a picture of her there when she visited Shah Jahan Mosque uh, in 1925 um, with her, and you can see her two granddaughters there as well with her. There was actually another picture which I forgot to add here uh, in, when uh, she was right in front of the mosque. And this is a picture of some women in 1917 who uh, came to celebrate uh, Eid al-Fitr, which marks the end of the month of fasting, which is going to start soon for us in April. And, you know, they, they, there are a lot of um, Muslim women converts, particularly from the Victorian time, who have been lost in history. Um, and we don't really have time to look into those. And that's not what I wanted to talk about today. But I'll just highlight uh, one more woman who I think is important to mention, other than Shahjah uh, Begum of Bhopal. And this is a picture of a few of the converts at the time. This must have been an Eid celebration as well.
And so the lady I want to talk about is Irene Mary Wentworth. And she was born in 1883, um, and she grew up amongst uh, the elites of the country due to her father being a prominent MP, and her mother was actually part of the extended royal family. And she used to visit Egypt quite a lot in the early 1930s, and that is the period when she's known to have become Muslim. And she is quoted as saying that she was a Muslim at heart long before she officially embraced Islam. And she was a central uh, figure in the Muslim world, the British Muslim society. And through newspaper reports, we can find that she was involved in quite a lot of events, organizing events. And one of those included um, the large Eid gatherings that took place at Shah Jahan Mosque. So I feel quite humbled being here, you know, as um, the Imam's wife sat here and being involved in the events here. And you think back the history and the people who've been involved with the mosque. And so Aisha Wentworth, she, who she became known as in her Muslim name, um, she was the second British woman to go on pilgrimage to Mecca. I think that was an amazing achievement. And I just want to end with this quote of hers. Um, after she performed the Hajj, she said that everybody desires world peace. Well, there is nothing which will better accomplish that than the festival at the end of the pilgrimage and Arafat, where all nationalities, black, white, brown, yellow, all dressed alike, kings, beggars, poor and rich, side by side, offer up one universal hymn of praise to Allah, to God. Surely this equality should encourage world peace. So that's where our presentation ends and we move on to Imam Hashmi. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen now so we can see everyone. Um, and Imam Hashmi is now going to talk a little bit about what's happening at the mosque nowadays. Thank you very much. Uh, Asalaamu As Alaikum uh, wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh and good evening to everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to speak with you in this way. Uh, I was noticing when uh, I was reciting something in the virtual tour, I was wearing same hat and same coat and uh, kosher she <laughs> reminded me. So uh, most of the things uh, Habib covered and uh, Kosar covered, just to for the part, part, participation, I would like to uh, take you a couple of minutes on the. We have five daily prayers here and two congregations of uh, Juma prayer too. And other than educational activities, children education, adult education, women education, adult uh, for men education, uh, 